The Gift of Therapy, Chapter 21 Frame Here and Now Comments Carefully Commentary on the here and now is a unique aspect of the therapeutic relationship. There are few human situations in which we are permitted, let alone encouraged, to comment upon the immediate behavior of the other. It feels liberating, even exhilarating. That is precisely why the encounter group experience was so compelling. But it also feels risky, since we are not accustomed to giving and receiving feedback. Therapists must learn to package their comments in ways that feel caring and acceptable to patients. Consider the feedback about boredom I gave in the last tip. I avoided using the word boring to my patient. It is not a productive word. It feels like an accusation and may or should elicit some unspoken or spoken sentiment such as, I'm not paying you to be entertained. It is far preferable to employ terms like distanced, shut out, or disconnected. They give voice to your wish to be closer, more connected, and more engaged and it is difficult for our clients to take umbrage at that. In other words, talk about how you feel, not about what the patient is doing. Chapter 22. All is grist for the here and now mill. Everything that happens in the here and now is grist for the therapy mill. Sometimes it is best to offer commentary at the moment, Other times it is best simply to store the incident and return to it later. If, for example, a patient weeps in anguish, it is best to store a here and now inquiry until some other time when one can return to the incident and make a comment to this effect. Tom, I'd like to return to last week. Something unusual happened. You trusted me with a lot more of your feelings and wept deeply for the first time in front of me. Tell me, what was that like for you? How did it feel to let down barriers here, to allow me to see your tears? Remember, patients don't just cry or display feelings in a vacuum. They do so in your presence, and it is a here and now exploration that allows one to grasp the full meaning of the expression of feelings. Or consider a patient who may have been very shaken during a session and uncharacteristically asks for a hug at the end. If I feel it is the right thing to do, I hug the patient, but never fail at some point, generally in the following session, to return to the request and the hug. Keep in mind that effective therapy consists of an alternating sequence, evocation and experiencing of affect, followed by analysis and integration of affect. How long one waits until one initiates an analysis of the affective event is a function of clinical experience. Often, when there is deep feeling involved, anguish, grief, anger, love, it is best to wait until the feeling simmers down and defensiveness diminishes. See Chapter 40, Feedback, Strike When the Iron is Cold. Jane was an angry, deeply demoralized woman who, after several months, developed enough trust in me to reveal the depth of her despair. Again and again, I was so moved that I sought to offer her some comfort but I never succeeded. Every time I tried, I got bitten. But she was so brittle and so hypersensitive to perceived criticism that I waited for many weeks before I shared that observation. Everything, especially episodes containing heightened emotion, is grist for the mill. Many unexpected events or reactions occur in therapy. Therapists may receive angry email or calls from patients. They may not be able to offer the comfort desired by the patient. They may be deemed omniscient. They are never questioned or always challenged. They may be late, make an error in billing, even schedule two patients for the same hour. Though I feel uncomfortable going through some of these experiences, I also feel confident that if I address them properly, I can turn them into something useful in the therapeutic work. Chapter 23. Check into the here and now each hour. I make an effort to inquire about the here and now at each session, even if it has been productive and non-problematic. I always say toward the end of the hour, let's take a minute to look at how you and I are doing today, or any feelings about the way we are working and relating, or before we stop, shall we take a look at what's going on in this space between us? 
Or if I perceive difficulties, I might say something like, before we stop, let's check into our relationship today. You've talked about feeling miles away from me at times, and at other times very close. What about today? How much distance between us today? Depending on the answer, I might proceed to explore any barriers in the relationship or unspoken feelings about me. I begin this pattern even in the very first hour before a great deal of history has been built into the relationship. In fact, it is particularly important to start setting norms in the early sessions. In the initial session, I make certain to inquire about how patients chose to come to me. If they've been referred by someone, a colleague or a friend, I want to know what they were told about me, what their expectations were, and then how their experience of me, even in this first session, has matched those expectations. I generally say something to this effect. The initial session is a two-way interview. I interview you, but it is also an opportunity for you to size me up and develop opinions about how it would be to work with me. This makes eminently good sense, and the patient usually nods at this. Then I always follow up with, could we take a look at what you've come up with so far? Many of my patients come to me after having read one of my books, and consequently it is a part of the here and now to inquire about that. What specifically was there about this book that brought you to me? How does the reality of seeing me match those expectations? Any concerns about a therapist who is also a writer? What questions do you wish to ask me about that? Ever since I wrote about patient stories in a book, Love's Executioner, many years ago, I assumed that new patients consulting me might be wary of being written about. Hence, I've reassured patients about confidentiality and assured them that I've never written about patients without first obtaining permission and without using deep identity disguise. But in time, I have observed that patients' concerns were quite different. In general, they were less concerned with being written about than with not being interesting enough to be selected. Chapter 24. What lies have you told me? Often during the course of therapy, patients may describe examples of deception in their life, some incident when they have either concealed or distorted information about themselves. Using here and now rabbit ears, I find such an admission an excellent opportunity to inquire about what lies they have told me during the course of therapy. There is always some concealment, some information withheld because of shame, because of some particular way they wish me to regard them. A discussion of such concealments almost invariably provokes a fruitful discussion in therapy, often a review of the history of the therapy relationship and an opportunity to rework and fine-tune not only the relationship, but other important themes that have previously emerged in therapy. The general rabbit ear strategy is simply to scan all material in the session for here and now implications, and, whenever possible, to take the opportunity to swing into an examination of the therapy relationship. Chapter 25. Blank screen? Forget it. Be real. The first model posited of the ideal therapist-patient relationship was the now superannuated blank screen in which the therapist remained neutral and more or less anonymous in the hopes that patients would project onto this blank screen major transference distortions. Once the transference, the living manifestation of earlier parental relationships, was available for study in the analysis, the therapist might more accurately reconstruct the early life of the patient. If the therapist were to manifest him or herself as a distinct individual, it would be more difficult, so it was thought, for the projection to take place. But forget the blank screen. It is not now, nor was it ever, a good model for effective therapy. The idea of using current distortions to recreate the past was part of an old, now abandoned vision of the therapist as archaeologist patiently scraping off the dust of decades to understand, and thus in some mysterious manner, undo the original trauma. It is a far better model to think of understanding the past in order to apprehend the present therapist-patient relationship. 
but neither of these considerations merits the sacrifice of an authentic human encounter in psychotherapy. Did Freud himself generally follow the blank screen model? Often, perhaps generally, not. We know this from reading his accounts of therapy. See, for example, the descriptions of therapy in Studies in Hysteria, or his analysands' descriptions of their analysis with Freud. Think of Freud offering his patient a celebratory or victory cigar after making a particularly trenchant interpretation. Think of him stopping patients from rushing on to other topics and instead slowing them down to bask with him in the afterglow of an enlightening insight. The psychiatrist Roy Grinker described to me an incident in his analysis with Freud in which Freud's dog, who always attended the therapy, walked over to the door in the midst of a session. Freud rose and let the dog out. A few minutes later, the dog scratched on the door for re-entry, and Freud rose, opened the door, and said, You see, he couldn't stand listening to all that resistance garbage. Now he is coming back to give you a second chance. In the case histories in Studies in Hysteria, Freud entered personally and boldly into the lives of his patients. He made strong suggestions to them. He intervened on their behalf with family members. He contrived to attend social functions to see his patients in other settings. He instructed a patient to visit the cemetery and meditate upon the tombstone of a dead sibling. The early blank screen model got reinforcement from an unexpected source in the 1950s when Carl Rogers' model of non-directive therapy instructed therapists to offer minimal direction, often limiting interventions to the echoing of the patient's last phrase. As Carl Rogers matured as a therapist, he soon totally abandoned this unengaged stance with the last-line interview technique in favor of a far more humanistic interactive style. Nonetheless, jokes, parodies, and misunderstandings of the non-directive approach hounded him till the end of his life. In group therapy, it is exceedingly evident that one of the tasks of the group therapist is to demonstrate behavior that the group members gradually model themselves after. It is the same, though less dramatic, in individual therapy. The psychotherapy outcome literature heavily supports the view that therapist disclosure begets client disclosure. I have long been fascinated with therapist transparency and have experimented with self-disclosure in many different formats. Perhaps my interest has its roots in my group therapy experience, in which the demands on the therapist to be transparent are especially great. Group therapists have a particularly complex set of tasks because they must attend to not only the needs of each individual patient in the group, but to the creation and maintenance of the enveloping social system, the small group. Hence, they must attend to norm development, particularly the norms of self-disclosure, so necessary for the successful small group experience. The therapist has no more potent method to build behavioral norms than personal modeling. Many of my own experiments in therapist self-disclosure originated as a response to the observation of therapy groups by students. Psychotherapy training programs rarely offer students an opportunity to observe individual psychotherapy sessions. Therapists insist on the privacy and intimacy so integral to the individual therapy process. But almost every group training program provides for group observation, either through a one-way mirror or video playback. The group therapists, of course, must obtain permission for observation, and group members will generally grant that permission but do so grudgingly. Characteristically, members resent the observers and often report feeling like quote-unquote guinea pigs. They question whether the primary allegiance of the therapist is to the group members or to the student observers, and they have great curiosity about the observers' and leaders' comments about them in the post-group discussion. To eliminate these disadvantages of group observation, I asked the group members and the students to switch rooms after each group meeting. The group members move into the observation room where they observed the students and me discussing the group. Group members at the following meeting had such strong reactions to observing the post-group meeting that I soon modified the format by inviting the members into the conference room to observe the discussion and to respond to the student observations. 
Soon the group members were giving feedback to students, not only about the content of the students' observations, but about their process. For example, they're being too deferential to the leader, or more cautious, stiff, and uptight than the therapy group. I've used exactly the same model in daily groups on the acute inpatient ward where I divide the group meeting into three parts. One, a one-hour patient meeting. Two, a 10-minute fishbowl session, the leaders and observers rehashing the group while seated in an inner circle surrounded by the observing group members. And three, a final 10-minute large circle in which members react to the observers' comments. Debriefing research indicates that most group members regard the final 20 minutes as the most rewarding part of the meeting. In another format for personal transparency, I routinely write a detailed and impressionistic summary of outpatient group meetings and mail it to members before the next meeting. This technique had its origins in the 1970s when I began leading groups for alcoholic patients. All that time, dynamic group therapy for alcoholic patients had a bad reputation, and most alcohol counselors had decided that it was best to leave alcoholic group treatment in the hands of AA. I decided to try once again, but to employ an intensive here-and-now format and to shift the focus from the alcohol addiction to the underlying interpersonal problems that fueled the urge to drink. All group members were required to participate in AA or some other program to control their drinking. The here and now focus galvanized the group. Meetings were electric and intensive, unfortunately far too intensive. Too much anxiety was aroused for members who, as many alcoholics do, had great difficulty binding and tolerating anxiety in any other manner but acting out. Members of the group soon began craving a drink after meetings and announcing, if I ever have to sit through a meeting like the last one, I'll stop in the bar on the way home. Since it seemed that the here and now meetings were on target and dealt with rich, relevant issues for each group member, I sought to develop some method to help diminish the threat and anxiety of the sessions. I employed a series of techniques. First, a here and now agenda written for each meeting on the blackboard containing such items as the following. To enable John and Mary to continue examining their differences, but to deal with each other in a less threatening and hurtful manner. To help Paul request some group time to talk about himself. Second, we used video playbacks of selected portions of the meetings. Third, after each meeting, I dictated and mailed to the members a weekly summary, which was not only a narrative of the content of each session, but also self-revealing. I described my experience in the group, my puzzlement, my pleasure with certain of my contributions, my chagrin at errors I had made, or issues I had overlooked, or members I felt I had neglected. Of all these methods, the weekly summary was by far the most effective, and since then I have made a regular practice in my once-a-week groups to mail a detailed summary to the group members before the following meeting. If I have a co-leader, we alternate responsibility for the summary. The summary has many and diverse benefits. For example, it increases the continuity of the therapy work by plunging the group back into the themes of the previous meeting, but I cite it here because it provides a vehicle for therapist disclosure. Multiple therapy is another disclosure-based teaching format I employed for several years, and in it, two instructors and five students, psychiatric residents, Interview a single patient for a series of six sessions. But rather than focus solely on the patient, we made a point to examine our own group process, including such issues as the student's style of asking questions, their relationship to one another, and to the faculty leaders, the degree of competitiveness or empathy in the group. Obviously, given the economic crunch of healthcare today, multiple therapy has no economic future. But as a teaching device, it demonstrated several effects of therapists' personal disclosure. It is good modeling for patients and encourages their own disclosure. It accelerates the therapy process. It demonstrates therapists' respect for the therapy process by their willingness to engage personally in it. Recall the experiment in which I and a patient named Ginny exchanged our impressionistic summaries of each session. This format was also a challenging exercise in therapist transparency. The patient had so idealized me 
had placed me on such an elevated pedestal that a true meeting between us was not possible. Therefore, in my notes, I deliberately attempted to reveal the very human feelings and experiences I had, my frustrations, my irritations, my insomnia, my vanity. This exercise done early in my career facilitated therapy and liberated me a good deal in subsequent therapeutic work. A bold experiment in therapist transparency that has long intrigued me was conducted by Sandor Ferenczi, a Hungarian psychoanalyst who was a member of Freud's inner psychoanalytic circle and perhaps Freud's closest professional and personal confidant. Freud, more drawn to speculative questions about the application of psychoanalysis to the understanding of culture, was basically pessimistic about therapy and rarely tinkered with methods to improve therapy technique. Of all the analysts in the inner circle, it was Sandor Ferenczi who relentlessly and boldly sought out technical innovation. He was never more bold than in his radical 1932 transparency experiment described in his clinical diaries, where he pushed therapist self-disclosure to the limit by engaging in quote-unquote mutual analysis, a format in which he and one of his patients, a female psychotherapist whom he had been analyzing for some time, alternated hours analyzing one another. Ultimately, Ferenczi grew discouraged and abandoned the experiment because of two major concerns. One, confidentiality, a problem because true engagement in free association would require him to share any passing thoughts about his other patients. And two, fees. Ferenczi fretted about payment. Who should pay whom? His patient did not share Ferenczi's discouragement. She felt the procedure had facilitated therapy and that Ferenczi was unwilling to continue because he feared having to acknowledge that he was in love with her. Ferenczi held a contrary opinion. No, 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 he opined. His real reason was that he was unwilling to express the fact that he hated her. Ferenczi's negative reactions to his attempts at self-disclosure seemed arbitrary and highly dated. My novel, Lying on the Couch, attempts to rerun his experiment in contemporary therapy. The protagonist, a psychiatrist, resolved to be totally transparent with a patient who, as it happened in this fictional tale, was committed to duplicity. One of my major intentions in the novel is to affirm that therapist authenticity will ultimately be redemptive even under the worst circumstances, that is, a clinical encounter with a scheming pseudo-patient.